Well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here at the uh, Gerald For R. Ford uh, Presidential Museum for this uh, lecture three panel. Uh, my name is uh, Joel Westfall, and I am the deputy director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library Museum. And it is my absolute pleasure uh, to introduce uh, this panel uh, dedicated to the vice presidency and the role and changing impact. So first of all, we have Chris Whipple. Uh, Chris is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Gatekeepers, How the White House Chiefs of Staff Define Every Presidency, uh, and of course, Spy Masters, How the CIA Directors Shape the History uh, and the Future. His most recent book uh, is The Fight of His Life Inside Joe Biden's White House, an insider's look at how President Biden and his team have battled to achieve their agenda. Chris has written for the New York Times, the Washington Post, Vanity Fair, and Politico. And then we go to Kate Anderson Brower. Kate is the uh, author of the New York Times bestseller, The Residents, uh, and First Women, also a New York Times bestseller, as well as the team of five, First in Line, and then the children's book, Exploring the White House, which was her, I think, third performance here for the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum. The Residence is being made into a television series produced by Shonda Rhimes for Netflix. Her latest book, Elizabeth Taylor, is the first authorized biography of the icon. She covered the Obama administration for Bloomberg News. She is also a former CBS News staffer for Fox News producer. Kate has written for the New York Times, Vanity Fair, and the Washington Post. And then we have Dr. Morel Luque, who is our supervisory curator, who um, has recently developed an inter uh, internal uh, exhibit for the National Archives dedicated to the vice presidency, and she will be the moderator for this panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a round of applause. All right, so welcome everybody and thank you for coming back for our after lunch panel. Um, I'm really excited to be here today with Kate and Chris to talk more about the vice presidency and really look about the context of the office and talk a little bit about how it's grown and developed and changed over time. Um, so to start off, you're both journalists who have published a number of books on a wide range of political topics. Uh, how did you come to study the vice presidency, and were there any particular events or individuals or experiences that really prompted you to want to study the topic? Um, we can start with Kate. Uh, thank you for the question, and thank you, Joel and Brooke, and everyone here at the Ford Library. It's been, I always, I always love visiting Grand Rapids and learning more about uh, this incredible presidency, and uh, and I particularly love learning about Betty Ford. Um, I think for for me, I I wrote the residence, which was about housekeepers and butlers at the White House, starting with the Kennedy administration through the Obamas, and so from that book, I wrote about first ladies, because a lot of the staff told me the first lady is the person who runs the show. And you know, if something needs to get done, they point to the upstairs and they say, you know, talk to the second floor. So I'm always interested in kind of the people standing to the side of the main character, the supporting characters of a story, because I think they give you unique insight. Um, they're on the sidelines. They're also firsthand witnesses to history. And the vice presidency seemed like a logical next story to tell, looking at the um, very complicated, difficult position that, like a first lady, there is very limited understanding of what a vice president does, other than succeed to the presidency if necessary, and you know, break tie-breaking votes in the Senate. And so it's, a, it's one of those uh, undefined pieces of American history, undefined roles, and I think there's such inherent tension there between presidents and vice presidents and this ambition that every vice president, except in modern history for Dick Cheney, wants to one day become president. So um, that was why I decided to write First in Line, which is about the modern vice presidency and that kind of fraught uh, relationship between presidents and vice presidents. Thank you. What about you, Chris? Well, first, 
<clears throat> let, me, let me just say what a pleasure it is to be here. This is my favorite presidential museum, uh, and it's always an honor to be asked to, uh, to come and speak here. Uh, my knowledge, you know, what, what little I know about vice presidents, I, I really came to through my work on uh, the, the White House Chiefs of Staff when I reported a book called The Gatekeepers back in 2017. <clears throat> and what I, what I learned was that White House chiefs and vice presidents are often on a collision course. Uh, it, it sometimes doesn't end well uh, it, as far as uh, governance is concerned. But there's always that tension. Um, and Dick Cheney, who ought to know, uh, told me that the, the White House chief of staff has more power than the vice president. That was true, except when Cheney was vice president, of course. Um, but it is generally true that the, 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 it's always a fraught relationship between the, uh, the vice president and the president um, to some extent, and, and also, of course, with the, with the White House chief. In the course of um, writing my latest book, uh, The Fight of His Life Inside Joe Biden's White House, um, I spent <clears throat> a lot of time talking to people about the relationship between uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, uh, which we can talk more about. Um, but I got to know Ron Klain, the White House chief, pretty well. And I would go, I would say to him on a regular basis, so what's, what's happening with Kamala? And, you know, why does she seem to be having uh, such difficulties? And Ron said, if you'll pardon my language, I will quote him directly. He said, Chris... It's just a shitty job. You know, uh, <clears throat> Klain ought to know because he served as chief of staff to not one but two vice presidents, Joe Biden and Al Gore. So uh, there you have it. Well, thank you. Um, so one of the things I think we've really been seeing both last night and at the earlier panel today is that over the course of history, the role of the vice president is not particularly well understood and their duties are not widely recognized. They kind of change over time based on the whim of the president or the particular in, um, inclinations of a vice president. So for both of you, as you've studied the vice presidency and particularly studied particular vice presidents, what constitutes the most significant and frequently overlooked aspect of the vice president's responsibilities? Um, we can start with Kate again. Well, when I think about the best relationships, and by the way, before I forget, to, to for Chris's point about um, the the power of being chief of staff compared to being vice president, I thought it was interesting that um, back in 80, when Reagan wanted Ford to be his vice president, Ford said, I'll only do it if I can be your chief of staff, too. Right, exactly. You know, because that, that completely illustrates the point that, that, that it's the chief of staff who holds most of the cards. and it, The vice president does what they're told, essentially. And I think that Joe Biden had a tough time at the beginning when he was Obama's vice president because he wasn't used to having a boss. And, and I remember interviewing interviewing Biden before he ran for president this last time. And, and he said it was really tough to be told, you know, where to go, what time to be there. You know, you are playing second fiddle. And he was, you know, always his own boss. He was a senator for so long in Washington and a creature of Washington. Um, and so I think that that relationship between Biden and Obama, which you've explored quite a bit, is especially interesting because I think we think of this bromance, but it's actually far more complicated than that. Um, but to your question about the the relationships, I think Mondale and Carter uh, were the first uh, Carter was the first president to really give his vice president a lot of power. He had an office in the West Wing. Mondale had access. I think that these successful relationships between presidents and vice presidents comes from the access that a president is willing to give the vice president. So are you in the room for major decision-making moments? And, you know, Biden would always say he was the last person in the room and he really meant it. And what is that, you know, translates into you are giving the president your unfiltered opinion. And, and Biden said he makes the wrong, he made the wrong call uh, with, for instance, when Obama made the decision to, um, authorized the assassination of um, Osama uh, bin Laden, 
Biden suggested that he not, you know, firmly thought that that was a bad idea. And Obama went ahead and did it anyway. And Biden took ownership of that, that he had made the wrong decision there. But the fact that the vice president was the last person in the room for such a consequential, uh, risky decision in the Obama presidency, I think says a lot about that relationship. Yeah, and I think it is so interesting the way you frame this idea of an aspect of their responsibilities is completely contingent on what the president will give them and whether they are able to be in the room. Um, and just before I turn it over to you, I just do want to jump in and go back to that point of Ford being a contender for Reagan's vice presidency. And of course, since we are here at the Ford Museum, I think that's such an interesting example of that idea of the tension between the power between the president and the potential vice president. Um, so there was a lot of discussion during that election that maybe Ford should be Reagan's vice president and that it would be the dream ticket because of the experience that Ford brought to the office. Um, but apparently in an interview with uh, Walter Cronkite, he asked kind of, well, would it be a co-presidency? And even though Ford demurred and didn't answer the question, didn't say, yes, it would be, Reagan's team was kind of so put off by that and that idea that it would be a shared presidency, that he wouldn't kind of be the one seen to be the one in charge, that the idea of Ford being the vice president was immediately kind of dropped at that point and should be stated Ford didn't necessarily want it either. But I think that is, again, kind of such a great example of this tension that you see uh, between the two people. Um, so to go back to the original question, um, so what, Chris, do you think is kind of the most overlooked aspect of the vice presidency? So <clears throat> let, me, let me just add to, to, the, to the story about the 1980 negotiation between Ford and Reagan. The idea was completely insane. I mean, it was, it was totally unworkable. And one person knew that immediately uh, behind the scenes. <clears throat> It was Betty Ford. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I only heard this story recently from the great Stu Spencer, who was uh, Ronald Reagan's legendary campaign manager in 1980 and <clears throat> often, often was the guy White House chiefs would call in when they were afraid to tell the president a hard truth. Uh, <clears throat> they, would they would call Stu and he would fly in from California and, and sit down with the president and tell him what was what. Um, anyway, the story that Stu told me was that as this cockamamie idea was being hatched in 1980, that <clears throat> Stu, Stu left the room uh, and he coincidentally just happened to run into Betty Ford coming in the other direction. And Stu said, why aren't you in this meeting, Betty? And she said, that son of a bitch does this, I'll divorce him. Yeah. <laughs> so that, that may well have been the end of that idea. So... Um, <clears throat> So going back, the, the relationship between the president and the vice president is is everything. You know, as Kate was saying, I, I think that uh, Jimmy Carter, the way he empowered Walter Mondale, uh, really was a a you know a seismic shift in the the role of the vice president. Um, the, Walter Mondale was really empowered by by Jimmy Carter to to be a, an advisor and a confidant. He, he gave him an office in the West Wing for the first time um, and <clears throat> a lot of responsibility. And he really did did involve Mondale in, in all of his major decisions. Um, Jerry Ford, by contrast, maybe ironically, because Jerry Ford had served as vice president, uh, you know, had a terrible relationship with Nelson Rockefeller, the larger than life, three-time presidential candidate uh, who was accustomed to doing things his way, Rocky's way. Well, Ford um, promised Rocky that he could be in charge of domestic policy. Uh, and, you know, this was, of course, you know, a, a nonsense. I mean, he, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't really ful fulfill that promise. Uh, but Rocky took it seriously. And, of course, he, he went off and he started uh, putting together all these expensive uh, plans uh, for for energy and everything else, and he would bring them to uh, to Ford. Ford would would listen politely, and after Rocky left, he would turn to his chief of staff, Don Rumsfeld, and say, "What do we do with this?" And Rumsfeld <clears throat> would. It, there were th sort of three the three magic words that Rumsfeld would say to kill Nelson Rockefeller's proposals were, "Staff it out." Um, that was the formula for you'd, you'd take you take a big proposal that was uh, 
uh, that was unworkable probably to start with, and then you would send it off to the Office of Management and Budget and the State Department and um, <clears throat> DOE and and let everybody have at it. And the result almost always was that Nelson's plan was dead on arrival. Uh, Rumsfeld took great delight, almost sadistic delight, in shooting down all of Rocky's ideas. It, their, their conflict was generational and ideological. Um, Rumsfeld was, I think, 23 years, Rocky's junior, both terribly ambitious, both wanted to be president. Uh, one of Rumsfeld's best friends told me that from the moment Rummy's feet touch the carpet in the morning until his head hits the pillow at night, he thinks about one thing, how to become president. Uh, <clears throat> and I think Rocky was the same way, and uh, it was a constant clash, and Rummy almost always won. Um, Long-winded digression from your question, but I think, I think it, it, it really, the key is, is whether or not the president empowers his vice president to be a real confidant and a participant in major decisions. That really began with Carter and Mondale, and we can talk about other presidents since. Well, thank you. And that actually, your response teed up my next question perfectly, um, which is, uh, in your book, The Gatekeepers, you really explored how the White House Chief of Staff uh, <coughs> works within the administration. And so I'm wondering if you can both talk a little bit about how the vice presidents work within administrations, because we often think of the vice presidency in opposition to or working with in conjunction with the president. But as you just illustrated, their relationship with the rest of the administration, and particularly with the Chief of Staff, is often essential in determining if the vice president will be a success. So um, if you could both expand a little bit more on that. Uh, well, it, as you were talking, Chris, I was thinking about how Gerald Ford, when he made the decision to replace Rocky uh, with Bob Dole, that was one of his biggest regrets, right? He he never forgave himself for that decision. And, and I think that if you look in discussions now about Kamala Harris and people talking about possibly replacing her. The idea for a president to ever replace their vice president is just never, it just doesn't happen because it makes it look like you're second guessing yourself. It makes you look weak. Um, so that just reminded me of that. But I, I think for my book, First in Line, one of the most interesting conversations I had was with uh, former Vice President uh, Al Gore. And he talked to, his vice presidency is really interesting to me because of course he was serving with the most powerful first lady in American history, with maybe the exception of Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, and so they were vying for power, they were vying for attention, and when President Clinton gave Hillary Clinton the health care uh, uh, overhaul, um, that was before Al Gore was given his reinventing the government. And so here you have the First Lady of the United States with a West Wing office, which was unprecedented, something she always regretted, actually. She always regretted having that West Wing office because of the backlash uh, that came from it. <clears throat> but the idea that you are a vice president your job is already difficult enough, and here you are vying for attention with the one person who has the president's ear at the end of the day and first thing in the morning, right? So when I interviewed Al Gore, it was actually one of, I interviewed every former vice president. It was one of the hardest interviews. I, uh, the process of getting it was really long and drawn out, and finally I got him on the phone, and you know, you much prefer to do things in person. It was a phone interview, so I couldn't see the expression on his face, but one of the first questions I asked him was how difficult it was for him to be working in a White House with such a powerful First Lady. And there was a pause, and he said, I think our conversation is almost over. <laughs> and I knew right then that I had struck a nerve and also I think a, a rule that you don't ask that difficult question right at the start of an interview. You save that for the end. Um, but he's still, I mean, this was an interview I did in 2017. I mean, this is still something very fresh for him and how difficult that was because here he was being given reinventing government. You can't really get a more dry uh, kind of boring platform than that. And the first lady is, uh, it didn't work out, but being given this kind of 
I don't know if healthcare is sexy, but it's a hugely important issue. And it was being given precedence uh, over what he was working on. So I think that that dynamic between Gore and Clinton and really the blame that Al Gore laid on Bill Clinton for Monica Lewinsky and the fact that he was lied to um, that Bill Clinton told him, you know, that, that, that he wasn't doing anything wrong and then that he blames Clinton, I think, still for the fact that he lost the election. Um, it's just, it, that's one of the most dramatic, dynamic vice presidential, presidential relations because these are two people very, you know, different economic backgrounds, because Al Gore, of course, was the son of a senator and very wealthy. Bill Clinton was, you know, brought himself up just by sheer strength of will. Um, but they got along really well, and they were from, you know, the baby boom de generation, and it was don't stop believing and all that fun, you know, stuff on the campaign trail. And then to have this drama engulf the presidency um, and ultimately cost Al Gore, in his mind, the presidency shows you that their fates are really intertwined. And that's one of the most recent dramatic examples of, of how much um, it's a symbiotic relationship between a president and a vice president. And the betrayal there is very real. And in that case, it's very personal. So I don't know if uh, how many of you were able to see the session with the White House photographers last night, but. Bob McNeely showed an extraordinary photograph that I'd never seen before of um, <clears throat> Bill Clinton uh, with Erskine Bowles and his chief, then chief of staff and Al Gore at the moment that Clinton was lying to them about Monica Lewinsky saying, you know, don't trust anything you're, you're hearing out there. I'm telling you the truth. And he was telling them a lie. Uh, it was really powerful to see. Um, let me talk a little bit about Kamala Harris and, and Joe Biden. Um, it's, it's a really fascinating um, and complicated relationship. And right from the beginning, I think that um, they, they had a real bond. I think Joe Biden really valued uh, Kamala Harris from the beginning. And in fact, he would, I was told, uh, told by more than a number of sources that he would want her in every meeting, um, not only the presidential daily brief uh, in the morning, which would often go for uh, way over time, hours over time, because Biden loves that stuff. Um, but he would look around, and if she wasn't there, he would say, where is she? And he, they were thrown together uh, quite a lot because of COVID. Uh, neither of them was traveling very much early in the presidency. And by all accounts, Biden really valued her uh, her ability to cross-examine briefers. Uh, you know, we 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 all saw her as a senator cross-examining witnesses on on live television, and we, you, you, it, she's very effective at it. As time went on, things got a little bit dicier, and it it, I, it may well have begun with her handling of the uh, the Northern Triangle portfolio and. And the border, and you remember, you may remember that she had a, this awkward interview with Lester Holt of NBC, in which she, she was asked why she hadn't been to the border, and she laughed about it, and um, <clears throat> and so forth. And as as she began to get a lot of criticism, um, word got back to Joe Biden that uh, not just Kamala, but the second gentleman, Doug Emhoff, was going around town and complaining to people that. Kamala had been given a, a much too difficult portfolio of assignments, that it was mission impossible. And this really just pissed off Joe Biden, uh, <clears throat> according to some of his close friends. Uh, and at one point, he said to one of these friends, when, when he asked, uh, you know, how's Kamala Harris doing, Biden rolled his eyes and said, well, a work in progress. Now, <clears throat> that was, you know, maybe a year ago. Um, I think that she has found her voice to some extent um, in a way that she struggled with early on. I think that when it comes to women's reproductive rights, she's been, she's been out there and she's been much more effective. And, and um, <clears throat> I think she's, she's doing much better than she was. 
but it's been a difficult struggle. And I, you know, some people have asked me, well, wait a minute, is, hasn't the White House really muzzled her? Have they, you know, have they clipped her wings and not really allowed her to, to get out there and do the job? And, and I think the answer is quite the opposite. Ron Klain, the White House chief at the time, told me he would go and see her on a weekly basis. They would have a talk. And Klain would say to her more often than not, you can't score runs from the dugout. We really want you out there. We want you to be, uh, you know, more more forward, uh, and 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 have a higher profile. And we want you. We you know we need you. And for whatever whatever reason, she was reluctant. Maybe burned by some of the early criticism. Uh, and of course, it's been widely reported. And I write about it in my book. Um, which, by the way, did I mention that it's on sale out here? <laughs> I'm happy to sign it for you afterwards. Um, <clears throat> And I mentioned in the book her real difficulties uh, managing her staff. Uh, it's just story upon story upon story. And I've talked to people going back to her days as California Attorney General. Um, and this has been a real problem for her. Um, so, you know, as, as Klain memorably said to me, Chris, it's a shitty job. It's a very difficult job to get right. Well, and I think both of your answers really illustrate how how difficult a position it is that you can't really win in a lot of ways. Hubert Humphrey once said, you know, the president has 190 million bosses and the vice president has 190 million bosses and one. So you're always trying to, you know, work within your own staff as well as figuring out how you can, you know, interact with the president and be successful in that way. Um, so Kate, in your book, First in Line, you talk about uh, candidate Trump's decision to pick Mike Pence as his running mate. So could you talk a little bit more about what went into that decision? decision and then more broadly um, how that picking a candidate uh, uh, running mate how that has evolved over time absolutely I will not forget that question but I do want to I, he keeps saying things that make me that make me think um, one thing I, I think that Biden does that's a, a small thing but it's a very big thing is he always calls her the vice president right not my vice president and that was something that I think he really resented with President Obama that it was my vice president it just it doesn't have a great ring to it, it she is the vice president of the United States well and they also emphasize the Biden Harris administration I right. mean every piece exactly. of paper that came out of that White House so Exactly. So I think he is trying to do that. But uh, the earlier panel was talking about first and being the first woman, the first uh, woman of color in that position. And we, we haven't even had a female chief of staff. Right. So, I mean, this is a, even though the chief of staff is more powerful. Um, so so this is a, a woman at the highest position in the U.S. government. And so I think when you are the first of anything, you are hyper paranoid and concerned about everything you say. In fact, I was just looking at a CBS interview she did um, in Indonesia that's going to air tomorrow where it was edited to, to make her sound defensive when, in fact, a whole part of the question that Margaret Brennan had for her in this interview was talking about how DeSantis based, and, and other Republican contenders for the nomination say, we have to be really worried. I pray every night for Joe Biden's health because look who's the vice president. You know, so she's fight, she's up against that. People thinking she's not up to the job, um, and I think when you've been the first of anything, there's there's a sense that you don't want to say anything that could get you in trouble. I interviewed Dan Quayle, and I went to New York. He works at a hedge fund. He's very wealthy now, and he said, you know, I will just never. Potato will haunt me forever. You know, so sometimes I think for vice presidents, there's this feeling of you can do more harm than good sometimes in talking. And uh, people, especially in Washington, it's everyone's favorite subject, I think, to talk about her staff. And, and, and I think there is a lot of mismanagement. But I don't think that she's, it's hard to point to, except for the Lester Holt interview, maybe, um, specific egregious things she's done wrong. Wouldn't you say it's more that she just hasn't done a lot right? 
Yeah, I think I would agree with that. I don't think she's done anything egregiously yeah. wrong. There, yeah. there have been no terrible misspellings or anything, but it doesn't take much for a vice president to step in it because already you're in this position that people want to mock anyway. I mean, look at Veep, right? Like, you, you have a whole... Um, TV show about it. And so I think it's it's a really difficult position to want to stick your neck out on any issue. Um, but to your question about Pence and Trump, I was surprised in my reporting for um, my book, First in Line, that Melania Trump had a big part in um, sort of suggesting that, that Pence be the nominee, that she thought that she was encouraging Trump to choose Pence, um, which I think is surprising given that she's such a, a cipher of a first lady. We know so little about her. And I would never think that she had a high political acumen. I wouldn't think that about her. And yet she in meetings said that Mike Pence, you have to go with him because he is the safe hands. You know, he is, uh, I, to an earlier point that Kurt made, you know, Mike Pence is the Christian conservative that Donald Trump needed to win that election. Um, and it was Melania Trump who was weighing in on that in the very early days. So it's, uh, I, I don't know, it, when the tape came out, the Access Hollywood tape, um, there was a period of a couple of days when the Pences were so upset they wouldn't talk to Trump. Um, Karen Pence was especially upset because she kind of runs that show and she's very, very conservative. And it deeply wounded them, that tape. Um, which I think um, is refreshing to, to see that there's like a moral backbone there, but I think they got over it quickly enough and took, his, took Trump's phone call and got back into the race. But, um, and I think we see now the reason for that is because Mike Pence, just like Donald Rumsfeld, wakes up every day, goes to bed every night, and he's thinking about being president of the United States. That's what he wants more than anything. So, um, but he was really the steady, safe, hands that they needed in the White House. And I think after January 6, what we saw was he really was what the country needed. Um, you could not have some volatile person uh, along with Donald Trump in the White House. Could you imagine what that would have been like? So um, it, it ended up being a, a very good pick. Can I just say about, <clears throat> about Dan Quayle and January 6, um, Quayle has more than redeemed himself for that potatoes incident. I mean, and, and not only that, I mean, of course, he famously, Quayle at one point before a trip to Latin America said he was going to brush up on his Latin. Uh, you know, that, that, that's, just, that's who we were dealing with. And yet, and yet, Mike Pence called Dan Quayle for advice on whether to certify the election or not, asked Quayle if he could, if he had the authority uh, not to certify Joe Biden, and Quayle told him in no uncertain terms, you, you cannot do that. So I think he's redeemed himself. Um, sorry. Well, that just made me think of another question. So we often talk about kind of the um, fraternity of presidents um, who, you know, go and do events together and talk to each other for advice. But can you talk a little bit more about uh, how do vice presidents interact? You talk about um, just now Quayle and Pence, but how have other vice presidents kind of given each other advice or warnings even? Um, <clears throat> So, you know, Kate might have a better answer to that than I would. Um, but I do think that there's a, I mean, the, the fraternities are interesting. And I, and I think that certainly the White House Chiefs of Staff uh, have, have had a tradition of reaching out to one another for advice. And in fact, the opening chapter of my book, The Gatekeepers, uh, was a, a, a scene where all the living, or many of the living White House chiefs of staff got together to give uh, Rahm Emanuel, the incoming chief, their, their best advice, or as Cheney put it, show him the keys to the men's room. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, they went around the table giving advice to, to Rahm, and they finally got to Cheney, and Cheney looked up over his glasses and said, at all costs, control your vice president. Anyway, that was <clears throat> that was a joke that Cheney tells every time they get together, and now now they just groan. Um, but anyway, I I, <clears throat> I I digress a little bit because I'm I'm just not as familiar with with how much the vice presidents talk to each other. I can say this quickly about 
about Obama and, uh, and Joe Biden. And that is, uh, you know, we, we think of those guys as having a kind of bromance. And <clears throat> we think of uh, Barack Obama being a, a real shoulder for Joe Biden to lean on when his son Bo was, was so sick and when he was dying. And, and all of that is true. And I think they had a strong relationship. But there's still an edge and a competitive, um, a, a com some competitiveness between them. Uh, and I think that Obama was not amused um, and not thrilled when early in uh, Biden's administration, um, all of his staff were talking about how they were going to be a transformational presidency and that their stimulus was going to be, a, a, you know, the, the, the ARP was going to be a really make a difference compared to that small potato stimulus that, that Obama did back in, in 2009. Um, <clears throat> and I think that didn't sit well with Joe Biden. I think there's, so there's a little bit of tension in that relationship. Yeah, and I would just say there's a, there's a bitterness there too in terms of Biden will say, when people say that Kamala Harris has been given such an unfair portfolio, people around him will say, well, do you think like the economic bailout or the Recovery Act was an easy portfolio, right? Do you think he was given all these sweetheart, easy to, to handle deals? No, he worked. He had to work really hard. And so he expects the same from his vice president. And he had the Northern Triangle, too, as part of his portfolio oh, as well. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, but to your question about relationships um, between uh, former vice presidents, you know, every modern vice president from Mondale on has asked to see the Mondale agreement uh, with Carter, which was, you know, he will be in the room for every meeting. He will have complete access. A lot of it is about access. Um, their staffs will be considered, you know, uh, on sort of parallel levels in the White House. I don't think it plays out that way all of the time. Um, obviously, that's not the case right now with Harris because her staff is supposedly, um, there's some bitterness there between the Biden staff and the Harris staff and uh, disorganization. But the idea is that the Mondale plan is the gold standard. And Biden wrote, uh, and, and I have this in my book, um, and Ron Klain was the one who showed it to me, was an agreement with Obama that says, you know, JRB will be in every meeting with BO. It's like in shorthand. And um, it's, it's almost like a signed agreement. Um, and then that is the, the understanding that he will be the last person in the room, which he really was the last person in the room. And the weekly lunches, I really can't stress enough how important those are um, for Al Gore and Bill Clinton. If that had to be canceled, Al Gore would demand and go to the chief of staff and say, we need to get it back on the schedule. If Clinton was traveling and they couldn't meet that week, he would, he would make sure that the next week they have that meeting. Because that that's when, and they showed this photo last night of Al Gore and um, Bill Clinton sitting there. Al Gore would go in with a binder full of things he wanted to ask. Um, you know, it is his uh, alone time, unstaffed time. Nobody else is listening in on that conversation. Incidentally, Rosalind Carter would do the same thing with Jimmy Carter. She would, you know, she was bother him. He said he wanted, when he got off the elevator on the second floor of the White House, he wanted to relax. And Rosalind would come up to him with a million things she wanted to talk about. Um, you know, different issues like her mental health campaign. And, you know, she was very much involved in that White House. And in a similar way, vice presidents want to make sure that their portfolios are getting attention from the president and that they're doing what they need to be doing. And so that weekly lunch doesn't seem to happen anymore. Um, and I'm not sure why. I mean, I don't know, Chris, if you know if it's happening, but my understanding is that, that Joe Biden and Kamala Harris don't have a weekly unstaffed scheduled lunch in the Oval Office or the dining room next to it. And I think that that's, um, that's a problem for her. And I think that shows that there's um, some tension in that relationship because he certainly knows that that's the expectation because that's what he did with uh, Barack Obama. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm curious to know why that's the case. And maybe I'll, I'm going to have to ask Jeff Science, the, the new White House chief, what's going on there. Yeah. Because that is that is curious, and you know, early on, um, when Ron Klain sat down with Kamala Harris and presented her with uh, 
a number of models and, and said that she could take her choice. She could, she could pursue the Carter Mondale model um, and all the way up to the, uh, the Biden, uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, the Obama Biden model. Kamala chose the Obama Biden model. Uh, and you would think that would include that weekly lunch, yeah. but it maybe maybe not. Yeah, I'm sure she wants it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that raises such an interesting question um, that I kind of discovered as I was researching this exhibit. You see these presidents who were former vice presidents, like Nixon to Eisenhower or LBJ to JFK and Biden to Harris. And you'd think in a lot of ways that these, form these presidents who were former vice presidents would maybe have some sort of, I don't know, additional sympathy for their vice presidents. And you see you know, how Nixon was really transformational in a lot of ways as a vice president because he was going on these foreign trips and more involved in um, the administration in a lot of ways than vice presidents before him. But then when he's president, um, Agnew is you know, very much out of the loop and not part of the inner circle, um, which maybe shielded him from Watergate, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, and then you also see with uh, LBJ asking for you know more and more powers. He's never happy with the amount of power he's given within the um, Kennedy administration, even though, of course, he has more power than other vice presidents. But then when he has his own vice president, Humphrey, he is a bit of a bully and you know leaves him out of decision-making process as well. So I think that is really an interesting thing that you see where the vice presidents or the, the presidents that were vice presidents kind of come into their presidential role and don't necessarily remember maybe what it was like or you know feel like well we had to suffer through it too and I don't necessarily have a question there but I think it's a, an interesting point so I think it's true I'm, I'm thinking of um, uh, after Ford uh, became Nixon's vice president which he said was the worst eight months of his life right um, because he, of course, you know, at the time, Watergate was uh, dragging on, and Ford would say he liked to get out of Washington as much as possible, so he didn't have to constantly ask, uh, answer questions about Watergate. And he was in this impossible position of, you know, if he was ever critical, it made it look like he was trying to get Nixon out of the White House, right? Um, but I think for Gerald Ford in particular, you know, he was working with a president that was could be very cruel. I think um, Nixon at one point told him in 76 that he would vote for John Connolly if he ran for president, right? And um, and and Ford said, that's, that's fine with me. Um, but it was this sense of, I earned this. And I think f there is not really an example of a vice president who became president who then takes it easy on their VP. And I think that's kind of unfortunate. The idea is that I, I worked hard to get to where I am. I've paid my dues. Now you're going to do the same thing. Definitely. And kind of back to my earlier question in terms of vice presidents communicating with each other. Of course, uh, Ford reached out to Humphrey when he became vice president to ask kind of what do you recommend? And Hubert Humphrey was very candid that, again, it was this very difficult uh, position and it was a hard position to fill. So I think there is that commiseration there between vice presidents for sure. Um, so while researching the exhibit, I learned that vice presidential candidates weren't typically vetted before they were picked. So the previous panel talked about how in the 19th century, many vice presidents were picked to balance the ticket without a lot of input from the presidential candidate. Um, but then after both Ford and Rockefeller had to face hearings after their nominations as vice president, and then the McGovern-Eagleton fiasco, people started thinking, well, maybe it's time to start vetting vice presidents more. Um, so can you both talk a little bit more about how that process plays a role in picking a vice presidential candidate? I think, it, <clears throat> I, think I would say to that that it is true, I think, that the process of vetting vice presidents has become much more thorough and elaborate and careful since uh, McGovern and Eagleton, which of course was such a disaster. Um, having said that, you know, it, it's not always as careful as you might think. And in, and in the case of Dan Quayle, for example, um, that, was, that was by all accounts a really impulsive decision by George H.W. Bush, who um, was really kind, kind of trying to demonstrate that he was his own man. Um, James A. Baker III, his close confidant and friend and... Um, <clears throat> There was a perception that Baker was calling the shots 
and that Bush was just kind of along for the ride, uh, and that Baker was the real brains uh, behind the operation. And I think that Bush's choice of quail was almost a kind of act of rebellion. Um, Baker was shocked that he, he'd chosen quail, and Bush didn't really tell, it, tell him until the last minute when it was too late for them to reverse that decision. So, and I think, <clears throat> boy, if John McCain could have done it over again, uh, Sarah Palin was a disastrous choice who, who wasn't carefully vetted either. Um, so, you know, it, it's not always as thorough and careful as you think. Yeah, and I always had that image of uh, Quayle coming up to hug Bush immediately after learning he was the and, nomination. And, and, you could, and the expression on Bush's face is just classic. You can tell he's thinking, what have I done? <laughs> um, the vetting process is really fascinating. There was some uh, controversy with Al Gore and whether he had ever, you know, smoked pot or done drugs, and um, everything seems kind of tame now, looking back on that time. But um, for Sarah Palin, I was told that it uh, it was very difficult in terms, and there was talk earlier about Geraldine Ferraro, and I think when you have a, a woman in this position, um, you're dealing with the husband's finances, famously. But for Sarah Palin, you're dealing with questions of, you know, instead of, um, I mean, they can get very personal. So they'll one vetter I spoke to, a, a lawyer at a big Washington law firm who did Hillary Clinton's vetting and several other candidates' vetting um, over the years talked about how they would bring a, a woman into the room for these questions. So if you're asking a female uh, presidential candidate if they've ever had an abortion, you want to have a woman ask that question. You don't want to feel like these, these men are um, asking you personal health questions. But they want to know if anything could come out that could be embarrassing. If you're a Republican candidate, that's something you definitely want to be open and honest about, because if that's leaked, um, it could it could destroy a candidacy still today, even more so today than a few years ago, actually. So um, I think it's a slew of really personal questions that go beyond finances. It goes into, you know, have you had any affairs? I mean, they're asking really embarrassing questions during this vetting process, and it's a very long, um, arduous process in most cases. So I don't know how... Sarah Palin got through it, but she did. Um, so some people slip through the, the cracks. Well, I think you see with the growing importance of recognizing that you have to vet vice presidents, also the growth of media coverage just of the vice presidency in general. So how do you both think that from radio and television to now social media, um, the vice presidency has been shaped by this kind of growing profile that we see? I mean, I think that we, uh, there's growing interest in the presidency altogether. So I think that translates into the vice presidency. But actually, I would say that I'm surprised there isn't more coverage of Kamala Harris. I'm surprised it's not a bigger story. She's a historic person, um, unprecedented, and um, having the first husband, uh, first second uh, gentleman, rather, is is a remarkable thing. Um, and I think it's really interesting what Chris said, that Doug Emhoff is actually weighing in and complaining on his wife's behalf, because that was usually something that women would do, right? It was always, you know, Nancy Reagan was always standing up for Ronald Reagan behind the scenes, and now you have a man doing it for his wife, which I think is fantastic. Um, so that role reversal is really interesting, but I, I'm surprised it's not a bigger story. Yeah, I, I am too, but, and, and I think, though, that to some extent, um, Kamala has shied away from taking, you know, really increasing her profile, and I think I'm encouraged that she's, for example, did the Face the Nation interview with Margaret Brennan, mm -hmm. um, however that turns out. I think, you know, for a long time, I mean, you, I've talked to the, the executive producers of these shows, and they were just beside themselves. They could not get her to do interviews at all. And that was true until quite recently, I think. I wonder how much of that has to do with, um, you know, what, look at Joe Biden on Meet the Press, right, when he came out in favor of gay marriage before the Obama administration had come out. And it pushed, and it moved the needle forward, and it, it was uncomfortable, and I think caused a lot of anger. In a good way, though. I mean. In a very good way. But could, is there, 
is there kind of an, uns I know you say that Ron Klain says she should do more, but is there a feeling that the Bidens know, Joe Biden and his, and Ron Klain know how, uh, if she does go off script, how complicated it can make their, their lives. If she were to say anything, and she's pretty far to the left of Biden, who's a moderate Democrat. Um, so I sometimes feel like she's in a defensive crouch because that she, if she goes on a Sunday show and says something that's more uh, liberal than he's willing, takes a position on the migrant crisis or whatever it is that pushes them into an uncomfortable position, she'll get in trouble internally. Yeah, but I, I, it, it, that's the job. Right. You know, you, you have to be able to walk that line, I think. And um, for whatever reason, I can't psychoanalyze her, but for, what, for whatever reason, she's been reluctant, you know. I think you certainly see just there is greater scrutiny and everyone is, as you say, more defensive now that there is this constant social media coverage that everyone has to kind of be more careful about things. Um, so the vice president has no official resonance um, until 1975 when one observatory circle opened. Um, and in the earlier panel, they talked a little bit about what that meant in terms of you know not having a place to host parties, not having a place, a reason to stay in Washington. Uh, so in 2015, Kate, you wrote the resonance about the White House and the White House staff. Um, can you talk a little bit about the vice presidential resonance and how that compares to the White House, how it's different from the White House? It's a beautiful, beautiful house. Um, it's a Queen Anne Victorian 19th century house um, about three miles from the White House um, on Massachusetts Avenue and it's gorgeous and secluded. A lot of people have no idea it's there. Um, big formal entertaining spaces, a pool. Um, Biden used to host these great parties for the press in the backyard and he would when he was VP and he'd have his German shepherds out running around and it was just like a it, it was so much fun. I mean, everybody wanted to take it. Sounds there. dangerous. Yep. Yes. <laughs> well, he actually would take a water gun out and run around with kids. I mean, it was a different time, very different time than we're in now. We have a photo of that in the exhibit yeah, with that. Great. It's so great. Um, and I, I talked to Barbara Bush about being uh, second lady versus being first lady, and she said one of the great perks was living in the observatory because... She could go out in her bathrobe with her cup of coffee in the backyard. Nobody had any idea they were there. Nobody cared. Um, and in the White House, you know, there's press everywhere. When I was um, a reporter for Bloomberg, you know, we would be staffed from 6 a.m. until 11 at night until a lid was called. They, they call it over the loudspeaker. Someone announces a lid, and that's when you're done for the night. So there's literally people in your house all the time. And in the observatory, you have this um, beautiful home. And it's just a turret, gorgeous white turrets. It's um, an old Victorian mansion. And um, I think that the vice presidents have a much better life in many ways because of that, because they don't have the you know, scrutiny that uh, presidents and first ladies do. And, and the observatory is a great example of that. It used to be uh, the Navy admirals house and the first president, uh, vice, vice president and second lady to live there were the Mondales. Um, Nelson Rockefeller could have, but he was so rich he had another house to go to and so why bother? Um, but it's a really beautiful gem of a house and you can actually get tours of it I think on Mondays. I think there's one day of the week that they let the public in. Do they have any pets? Do Kamala and, and Doug have any That's pets? That's a really that good up? question that I don't, I don't know the answer to. Mm. That's a very good question. I don't, th I don't think so. I haven't seen anything about that. So if you'll permit me, I'll t just tell a quick funny story about uh, my book on, on Biden. Um, it, about a week after it came out, um, it suddenly went viral on Twitter. It, Twitter exploded, but not at all for the reason that I was expecting. Um, it turned out that I told a story about Joe Biden walking around the residence with a close friend early on, and he came to a place where Major, his German Shepherd, had supposedly bitten a Secret Service agent, and he turned to his friend and he said, the Secret Service is never up here. It didn't happen. It did not happen the way they said it happened. Well, um, the, the whole, I, I also tell the story about how Biden um, w worries about his Secret Service detail because he thinks there are MAGA sympathizers uh, among his detail. But my story about 
Port Major, uh, <clears throat> just lit up Twitter. I mean, dog lovers went absolutely bananas, and it got something like 350,000 shares, and, and there was this, they were led by somebody who called himself or herself the Oval Pawfus, P-A-W-F-F-I-C-E, and everybody went bananas, but uh, so anyway, presidential pets are clearly, clearly have fo a following. I like that story, it, it reminds me, um, so one of my best friends wrote a story about the fox, a fox living on the south lawn of the White House. So this is pre-Trump. And I was just talking to her. It was a Wall Street Journal piece she did. And we were just talking about the softer side of Washington and kind of feature pieces about the cat or, you know, everyone knew about socks, right? The Clinton's cat. And we know about Major now because of your story. And um, you can't really do those stories anymore because of, <laughs> we have a former president who's being indicted, right? So those softer stories, I think, bring life to the house. And um, I just think it's it's a, a little aside that it's kind of a shame that that's something that's that's dying off. So And you see how much people still love them. All right, so uh, we're just about uh, ready to turn it over to questions from the audience, um, but I just wanted to end. Um, both of you really explore this idea of power in American politics and power in the presidency, um, but what, what in your opinion is kind of the, the power of the vice presidency or the kind of most surprising aspect of the vice presidency? I mean, I, uh, when I talked to Dick Cheney for my book, First in Line, he said the most consequential vice presidents are the ones who go on to become president. He clearly is one of the most consequential vice presidents in American history, and he had no interest in becoming president. So I disagree with him on that. Um, it's being an advisor and being the uh, last person in the room who the president is talking to. That's the power of the vice presidency. It can catapult you into the presidency, as we've seen I believe Biden's the 15th vice president to become um, uh, president, and it's been um, something that you can use in a way because you have access to donors, you have more, I, I don't know if everybody knows who the vice president is, but you have more name recognition than, in, say, a governor usually. Um, but I think there are also downfalls to it because look at Mondale, right? If you're working for a president like Jimmy Carter, a one-term president, it could break badly for you because you are answering for that, what that president did in office. And so you had really high inflation when Carter was president. And then, you know, Mondale is not seen as incredibly effective because that presidency wasn't seen as incredibly effective. When in, in fact, he was incredibly effective behind the scenes and really a, a transformational vice president. And that relationship, as we said earlier, was really transformational. Um, and I think what we saw with Pence and Trump with January 6th, I mean, there, that was a powerful moment that really illustrates how important the, you know, the uh, morality and basic standards um, of a vice president is. The fact that he wouldn't certify the election um, that, that he was not going to do what Trump wanted him to do, that he was going to certify the election, shows that vice presidents have incredible uh, responsibility. So let me just talk a little bit about Dick Cheney because um, I, I just think he's maybe the most fascinating character um, of the uh, 20th, 21st century, um, one of the most fascinating political characters. I know, I, I got to know him pretty well and spent a lot of time interviewing him uh, in Jackson Hole and in his place in Maryland and, um, <clears throat> and elsewhere. And he would, he could talk to you all day long about being Jerry Ford's 34 year old White House Chief of Staff. It, it was the time of his life. And he was actually, at the time, maybe, believe it or not, the most popular guy in Washington. Uh, his Secret Service moniker was backseat. He was a guy who you you wanted in the room when you had a really difficult discussion and needed somebody uh, to help bring consensus. Uh, he had a great wry sense of humor. He loved to play practical jokes on the press corps. They all loved him. Um, <clears throat> and for ever since, it's been kind of a parlor game among all the White House chiefs. What? in the world happened to Cheney. 
you know, how did, why, did he, why did he change? And there are lots of theories, and Cheney's own theory about it is, well, I didn't change, the world changed on 9-11. Um, anyway, he, he, he loved being White House Chief of Staff. Uh, Vice President, not so much. He doesn't like to talk about it nearly as much. Um, but he was, I completely agree, the most powerful Vice President we've ever seen. I called him the week before the 2016 election. Uh, got him on a cell phone. He was out in Jackson. He was out in Wyoming. I said, where are you, Mr. Vice President? He said, at the moment, Chris, he said, I'm at a McDonald's in Larrabee, Wyoming, having a cup of coffee. And he said, I used to run things. Now I'm the chauffeur. He was driving Liz Cheney around uh, as she was campaigning for her seat. So uh, what a story. Um, and I, I, I agree that he was the most powerful VP, but uh, I don't think he, he enjoyed it much. That definitely seems to be a theme for many yes. vice presidents. Yes. No, I think he, one of the reasons he didn't enjoy... Well, one thing that I found astounding about him is he had this kind of Darth Vader uh, you, uh, caricature of him, that he was this really tough, nasty, difficult person. And, and he loved the image. He loved it. He reveled he in it. He loves it. it. Um, and I was really intimidated going to his house. And he could, as you said, he would have talked for hours more about being Gerald Ford's chief of staff. And he was really just lovely person, um, but he did not really want to talk about the Iraq war um, uh, for obvious reasons. And also, and I, I'm blanking on why this happened, but he and Bush ended on a very bad note. Scooter Libby. Yes, okay, Scooter Libby, thank you. So I think that's also um, one reason why he doesn't want to is get into the relationship too much. And I'm unclear, it, it seemed even at the time when I talked to him and I guess it was 2017, there, there was still some bad blood there between them all those years later. So that might be another reason why he, he doesn't like to relive those No, really years. true. All right, well, thank you both so much for your observations and for offering more context about this office and the difficulties and um, you know extraordinary experiences of the people who held it. So thank you very much. How you doing? I enjoyed this panel. But I do want to ask, which vice president had the best office to get bipartisan legislation done? Because there's been a lot of, lot of uh, bad blood between the Democratic and the Republican Party. And I want to know, which vice president do you feel was in the best position to get bipartisan legislation done? I guess, I guess I'd say Joe Biden, uh, that nobody was better at it, um, maybe since Lyndon Johnson, at um, <clears throat> corralling people from both sides of the aisle. And I think he, I think he helped, uh, I, I really think he helped Barack Obama a lot. <clears throat> um, and, and, and we've seen in his own presidency uh, just how effective he, he's been at, um, you know, in, in January of uh, 2021, um, nobody believed, would have believed that he'd be able to pass the bipartisan legislation that he's managed to do as president, I think. Um, but that's the way he's always rolled. I mean, that, you know, Joe Biden is a throwback to the, you know, the days when uh, people could make deals across the aisle. And I think he's, I think both as vice president and as president, he's been pretty good at it. I think that's a great question. I mean, it's... Um because it also calls to mind whether or not any vice president, how, how effective they are at, in the legislative process to begin with, right, at all. Um, but I think that Biden would be the best answer, at least in the modern vice presidency, um, in terms of being able to make calls to Capitol Hill, go up and kind of 
um, forge these friendships. You know, he was friends with McConnell. He has friendships with with people across the aisle. And so I know that Barack Obama didn't really like dealing with members of Congress. And he would tell, because he, he just thought it was time consuming and difficult. And so he would tell Biden to get on the phone with his friends. And kind of, a I think it could sometimes come across as a bit demeaning. But like, you know, Joe, why don't you go, call, you love going to the Hill so much. Why don't you go back up there? Um, whereas I think for Obama, he saw it as just a lot of gridlock and and needless politicking. And that's what, like Chris said, Biden's such a throwback to an earlier era. And so I would say Biden, too. Thanks, Joel. Uh, very good. Thank you very much. I'm Jason Duncan. Uh, I teach history at Aquinas College in Grand Rapids here. And, uh, I'm finishing up a book in the 1836 election, and the main candidate was Vice President Van Buren, and it seemed that he really set a, a pretty good model for how to succeed in the Vice Presidency. I mean, this is going way back, you know, 112, 82 years ago or something. But he, he was known as a little magician, and Jackson, Andrew Jackson, who was very different and then Buren, and their personas, and Jackson's an Indian, you know, he's a fighter, he's a general, I mean, Buren's more of a lawyer politician, and a lot of Jackson's people couldn't figure out why he liked Van Buren. They say he's a wimp, he's a New Yorker, he's not one of us, he's noncommittal, he's never been in the army, you know, and Jackson, who made up his own mind, he wanted Van Buren. So he insisted on Van Buren being vice president in 1832. Jackson and Calhoun had a falling out. It sounds even worse than uh, Bush and, and Cheney, which I didn't know to just three minutes ago, so thanks for that. I did not know that. But uh, Jackson had threatened to hang his previous vice president, John C. Calhoun, and he meant it. He didn't make idle yeah. threats. So At least he didn't try to do it. Yeah, he, he didn't try and do it. But he and Van Buren took, like, weekly, or not know, weekly, but frequent horse rides to Georgetown, kind of their version of the presidential, vice presidential lunch, I guess. And Van Buren was active in the administration. I mean, I'm, it wasn't as, a, you know, as bureaucratic as later, but he advised Jackson and on certain issues with, with an eye to the election of 36. So when Jackson was all for Van Buren succeeding him, and that was one of the big issues in the campaign. It's like, how can he impose his successor on us? This is not republicanism. This is the monarchy type politics. But it, Van Buren won. He lost Jackson's home state. Backlash against Van Buren from the Tennesseans. But he was the last vice president directly elected until 1988, which is really strange when you think about it. I mean, you're right there. Many VPs become president, as we know. And even though it's a long time ago and it seems less than relevant in the you know, pre-Civil War era, and, but uh, I guess I'm surprised that other vice presidents weren't able to use that position as well as Van Buren did, although Van Buren's own vice president, it didn't work out because Jackson wanted him in as well. Richard Johnson, the most obscure of our three Johnson vice presidents, uh, it didn't work out for a lot of reasons, but Van Buren's vice president Vice Presidency did. So it is, it does sort of stick out in the history of the office over the years. Thank you. Well, absolutely. And that was George H.W. Bush when he announced his his own presidency. <clears throat> he said, it's been a long time, Marty, because as you say, he was he was the next one to do that. We but that, and that's good. yeah, right. Um, but I think you see that it is difficult with the vice presidents because even as they're trying to campaign, they're still a part of the president's administration. So they can't necessarily take stands on issues that maybe they would if they were campaigning on their own. So they do have that name recognition, but at the same time, they're still having to toe the line within the administration. And you see this, um, for example, with Hubert Humphrey when he was trying to decide if he was when he was getting ready to run, perhaps, and Johnson was kind of going back and forth whether he himself was going to run and he wouldn't necessarily say. And so there's there's a lot there that they maybe can't necessarily step out on their own. Um, so even if they have that recognition, they, they can't harness that power. I think it's really hard for a leader. It, it's like structurally impossible. Uh, thank you. Good afternoon. I've uh, been intrigued by the evolution 
of the vice presidency that I've kind of heard over the uh, last couple of days here from the um, nuclear age, the 25th Amendment, and I was particularly intrigued about the uh, Mondale vice presidency. I wonder if you could comment on what you see the future iterations of the vice presidency or how you think it should be maybe restructured or something in, in today's age. You know, I think it's a really interesting question. Um, one of the things that struck out to me most in this conference is last night, the wonderful White House photographers were talking, and Bush's photographer, and I, his name escapes me, but he's David Valdez. David Valdez. Wonderful story. Um, they, they all told incredible stories, but David told a story about uh, Reagan being um, hospitalized. And of course, when a president is incapacitated, the vice president is in charge. And Bush was playing tennis, he said, a Bush 41. And he fell and hit his head and was passed out for a few minutes. And he said, you'd never seen the White House doctors run faster you know, than when they did that moment to get Bush to wake him up. Because there was nobody, nobody in charge at that moment. I mean, it would have gone to the Speaker of the House, and you go through the lines of succession, and what are the chances that something would happen in this five-minute stretch or whatever it was? But I think it is scary that something like that could still happen, where we have nobody in charge of the country for any period of time. So it would be, um, I think there should be, if you were going to restructure the vice presidency, I think it would be it would be smart to make sure that nothing like what happened with Truman and uh, Roosevelt hap happens again in terms of a vice president becoming president and not knowing about the Manhattan Project or not knowing details about it. I mean, that's horrific to think of. So is there a way to make sure that a vice president is clued in at the level that a chief of staff is always clued in? I'm not sure how you would do it, but I think to raise the profile, not in the media, but internally in the West Wing, would be a really smart idea. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure I have any thoughts on how to restructure it, um, the, the vice presidency, but um, but just tell you a quick story from my book, The Gatekeepers. Uh, when Ronald Reagan was shot down um, and, and was rushed to uh, the hospital and was on the operating table, um, Jim Baker, the White House Chief of Staff, went into a closet with a utility closet with Ed Meese, uh, the, the, the legal uh, counsel. And they talked about whether to invoke the 25th Amendment while Reagan was unconscious. And, and Baker um, decided not to do so. Uh, at that moment, um, George H.W. Bush was in Texas about to fly back. Uh, and Bush decided that he would not take a helicopter to the South Lawn because he didn't want it to look as though he was making a, a power grab, um, as he put it. And it was, so it was incredibly fraught, this, you know, this whole period. And they were so sensitive, and Baker was so sensitive to even the appearance of the vice president trying to seize power while Reagan was unconscious. And they just decided he's coming out of surgery pretty soon, so let's leave it. Uh, leave it. So for a while there, there, nobody was in charge, except, of course, Al Haig thought he was. <laughs> all right, thank you all very much. Um, thank you for your questions and your attentive listening. Um, so this concludes our uh, panel and the conference, so thank you. And we'll be signing books, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah uh, just so you know. Thank you very much. And just so everybody everybody is well aware, um, we are going to be getting back together really soon here because our final keynote, of course, Richard Norton Smith uh, will be on the stage uh, closing out our conference on the vice presidency. And I know those of you who know Richard Norton Smith, of course, he is someone not to be missed. <laughs>